Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our witnesses, thank you so much for, for being here today. We appreciate y'all's time and expertise. Um, I, I always look at the lens, uh, look at life through the lens of what our people back home really want. And it doesn't matter where you come from or, or, or what part of the world you come from here, people want a good job where they can take care of their families. They want to come home to a de decent, safe place to live after a hard day's work. They want their children educated, and they want to be left alone by D.C. For, so that they can be who they want to in this great country. Education is at the forefront of that. We have seen a tremendous growth in jobs thanks to the manufacturing boom and the technology investment from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. My dear friend from New Jersey references, didn't call it by name, but we've seen that and we should be investing more in America and we should be doing things that make America more competitive around the world. The key to that though is to make sure that we've got a workforce that's ready to go. And I've seen for far too long when we tell every kid there's only one pathway in education, there's only one way to go, that we wind up with a less competitive global workforce. So investments in trade, technical colleges, uh, the, you know, the charter schools, we need a diversity of options. We've raised six kids. They've all gone different directions. Some into college, some into the military, some into technical schools, everything from you know, from logistics to, um, to, to cybersecurity uh, to the arts. We've got, it, we've, got, we've, we've got it covered. And the one thing I can tell you <clears throat> is that, that sometimes public education was the right choice for a child. Sometimes it was, it was private education. But as a parent, I want choices for my kids, just as millions upon millions of Americans do. Mr. DeAngelis, it was interesting you talked about rural communities because there's a real challenge when you look at, um, if you're in a rural community, you've got, one, you've got one choice. It's a public school system, okay? There may, you know, it, it, there may be a small private school, but it's, it, it, it's the public schools. Um, how important is it that we could use um, these funds to improve the technology piece of what we're doing in, in rural schools where they may not have the tax base to, to go in and make the investment that they need to be competitive with other schools. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'll just point out the nine most rural states already have some form of private school choice. West Virginia being one of them, actually the first state to be the, the one to go all in on school choice with universal <clears throat> eligibility uh, back in 2021. But I think it's super important for any of these proposals to allow for non-private school tuition uh, expenses as well as to maximize the flexibility and customization on the part of the parent, but also to allow for more innovation in the public school sector and the private school sector as well. Uh, if you look at the state level bills that are passing, a lot of them are called education savings accounts that you can use it like a voucher for a private school, but you could also use it for these micro schools or pandemic pods or even just homeschool curriculum and other expenses. So it really takes us from school choice to education choice and uh, maximizes flexibility. I think that's the way to do it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rudman, you told an amazing story about a young man. He must have been pretty stout to pick you up and throw you around. Um, <laughs> but you, you talked about um, his success and, and growing a business, and you talked about him. But can you speak for just a minute about the impact that he had on so many other families because he, not, because he provided jobs for them? So uh, there's two folds to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman, by the way, for that question. Uh, there's two parts to that, um, to my answer. One is not only did he provide jobs for the folks that work for him, you know, but he also provided mentorship back to some of my students. So if whenever I had a student who didn't, uh, was struggling and wasn't sure they were gonna make it, there were times I would sit them down and counsel with them, and I would literally put my cell phone out on the table and call him. I could still do that today. Call him, and he'll pick up the phone and goes, Brother Jerome, what are you doing? You know, and he's excited, and, and then he says, you got another one for me? I said, yes, I do. And he just explains how, how he made it and even discloses his income and so on and so forth. Mr. Redmond, one final question. You, you deal with things that stick to the ground, which are trucks. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think a modification of this plan to expand it into the other areas, say for airline pilots, do you think that would be helpful as well? Well, anything that's going to help, uh, anything that would help folks uh, utilize these funds for, for more educational purposes or more choice, I think is a good thing. You know, but, uh, but mainly, you know, I speak mostly for my, for my industry, so. Thank you for that. Yield back. Mr. S. 